we need. We need a renewal. We just need a renewal of the presence of God. You know what triggers a renewal? You know what moves God's heart? Hunger. Hunger. I just so desperately just want a renewal of the presence of God here. In our cities, and, but it's just going to start here. It's just got to start here. It's got to start in here. We just, we need to hunger for more of him, for more of his presence, for just spending time with him. And in that place, his presence will pour out. We will experience a renewal of the presence of God. We will be changed truly. And then revival comes. And that's when we see broken people healed and lost people found. Oh, we just need a renewal of the presence of God. God, let it be. Holy Spirit, let it be. We just want that. We just want that. That's not what I'm talking about today. (laughs) I just had to release that to you. Ah, he is so good. He is so good. Our students are away at, at youth camp. Um, you prayed over them last week and sent them out. They've been there since since Thursday. They're coming back today, and they've just had powerful encounters with the Lord. And I'm so excited to hear of all the testimonies. We've heard a little bit over text message, um, but um, God is good. So thank you in advance um, for, for, you know, sending them out and then for what you're going to hear. We just appreciate so much your investment in their lives. Sometimes when we are in desperate situations, we make desperate choices. You guys ever have one of these? An etch a sketch. I drew this this morning. I don't know what it is, but after I drew, I was like, whoa, what does that mean? <laughs> it felt like something prophetic. I'm not sure. I took a picture of it. But an Etch-A-Sketch, I grew up having one of these, and I always was try- would try to draw the perfect thing. And you know, like, if you're, if you're trying to dry- draw something specific, and then you turn the knob the wrong way, you mess up the whole thing. <laughs> and then you have to shake it and start over. An Etch-A-Sketch. Ever want to erase something real, real quick <laughs> before someone sees it, hears it, knows about it? You know, you make a post maybe on social media, on Instagram or Facebook, and you're like, uh, maybe I shouldn't have done that. <laughs> or you say a joke, and it literally doesn't land. And you're like, ah. It happens a lot to Craig. Yeah. It's the comment that you make in a, situ- in a conversation, but it doesn't relate to what's happening, and people were like, what, like, what are you talking about? Or an, an idea that you suggest that's actually not a good one, you know? <laughs> it's like, it was kind of a dumb idea, that, that that's not going to work. Or then there's the angry comments in a, in a fight, in an argument, You're like, ah, oh, I wish I could take that back. Or how about this one? The text you sent to the wrong person. We just want to shake that out, start over. This morning, 
What is a life worth saving? Because sometimes when we are in desperate situations, we make desperate choices. At age 19, a young lady by the name of April Hernandez Costello found herself in an abusive relationship. She escaped, but shortly after, she discovered she was pregnant. She said, the sun was shining on my face and the sky was blue, but I was empty. My womb was empty. My soul was empty. My spirit was empty. The guilt she felt for what she just did brought her to a place where she couldn't imagine a future where she could have children one day. She felt she didn't deserve it anymore. This now sense of what her life and future should look like as a result of a desperate move in an impossible situation. See, the enemy is a lot of things. But one thing that he does so well, the one thing that he so carefully crafts as to make us think that maybe we did it or maybe we made the choice or the one thing that, that maybe we don't even realize he's doing or the one thing that he manipulates in order for us to believe that it is kind of the best case given the situation is provide alternate validated routes as an option to our impossible situations. This looks like a mom trapped in an abusive relationship. She stays because it is just impossible to leave. What she should do, leave. What she does, stay. Because, you know, he's sorry and it will be okay. An alternate validated route. It's a quick cash opportunity that's less than legal, but rent is due. And if, if I miss it this time, then I'm out on, uh, you know, on the street. And what should I do? I should walk away. What do I do? I take the money because no one's going to find out anyway. It's an alternate validated route. It's an addiction that you look to. To numb the pain that you can't get away from in your life, but no one will find out anyway. And, 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 and you, need, you need help to function at work or at home. So what should you do? You should tell someone and get help. But what do we do? We give in to the addiction because we're not really hurting anyone. Maybe we're even helping them by, you know, numbing our pain a little bit. Alternate validated route. John 10.10 10 says the thief comes only to kill, to steal, and destroy. But he said, Jesus, I came that they might have real and eternal life, more and better than you've ever dreamed. See, these alternate options look good, sound good, and they actually, if you do a pro and con list, it makes it seem like it tips in your favor. But too often, in actuality, it is one of life's killers, mask the, by the enemy as alternate, validated roots of the best case in an impossible situation. It's the enemy's silent attack to destroy our lives. See, we look at John 10.10 and we're like, okay, I see it. All right, it's all out in the open. The thief comes to steal, kill, and destroy. Okay, so when he comes to do that, I'm going to see it. Like it's going to be obvious that he's doing that. His attempts on my life, I won't, they won't go on notice. But really, more often than not, they are subtle. They are secret. They are unassuming. They are alternate, validated roots that in the end steal, kill, and destroy. Because that's what the thief comes to do. But Jesus, but Jesus says, I came. You can have a life, a better life, a good life, better than you ever dreamed. Here and then in, in the age to come. I use this phrase sometimes. This is just an impossible situation. Sometimes I say that. I, I look around and I'm like, oh, it just doesn't seem like a win here. It's just an impossible situation. But the reality is there are no impossible situations. Because Jesus. Because Jesus Jesus said in John 14, verse 6, he said, I am the road, also the truth, and also the life. Jesus said, 
I am the road. This means whatever you're facing today, because there is no actual impossible situation, whatever struggle, whatever impossible task, whatever no way out situation, whatever rock bottom of your life that you have to face, it's really actually the most ripe, ready, and resourced anything could ever be because Jesus. I am the road. He says, I am the road out of your problem and into your solution. When you don't see the road, feel the road, know the road, he is still the road. A little later, April, a little later in life, April found herself in a new relationship. Her now boyfriend asked her to go to church. She agreed, but she wasn't happy about it. They find their seats. They're there the Sunday morning. The service moves through the various stages, the welcome, the worship, the word. The preacher begins talking about forgiveness. April's heart, as she sat there and shook, was pounding. The call was given, and she literally couldn't sit any longer, and her wobbling legs ran her to the front. She dropped to the floor in fetal position and sobbed. Her soul was sobbing. Her road that day was just that few feet up the aisle, that church aisle from her seat to the front. Jesus, her road, brought her to this place. See, the enemy will present many roads in our lives. Many roads, but he is the road. He is the road. He also said, I'm also the truth. See, it's not my truth, your truth, their truth, someone else's truth. It's the truth, Jesus. This whole um, my truth, your truth movement is a prevalent belief that self has the final authority on the issues of life. The problem with that is that when you reach a place with your belief system or truth that goes opposite of what the Bible says, you will pick self. Why? Because you have now created a belief system in your life for what's true for you. And this has become who you are and what you stand on. And maybe you never ever wanted to come to the point where you don't believe the Bible in its fullest. But because time after time during complex issues, you have created a belief system that feels right to you, that sounds right to you, and that is also inclusive of what you value and the people you care about, now you don't believe the Bible completely anymore. Somehow what was your foundation has now become low-key in your life. Since the uprising of you do you, my truth, your truth, I do how I feel, you do what you think, it's all good, it will be all right, there has actually been an uprising, an increase of depression and anxiety by about 70%. It's because we've gotten away from Jesus. It's because we've gotten away from the word, the absolute truth that protects us at every angle. See, it's not just for what feels right in this moment and what is applicable right now today in our culture, but, but this works for longevity. Jesus works forever, and he is actually timeless, okay? Because Jesus doesn't outdate, but our concepts and ideas do. And we need to just understand that. This is not an attack on you or me or what we feel in this moment, but this is just the truth of the reality is that our concepts and ideas will outdate. They will. If we live this way, there will come a time when future you will renounce past you belief system. You'll be like, I didn't, didn't even believe that. We need to exchange the authority of self for the authority of Jesus. So specifically this morning, on the topic of the unborn, I'm just going to present a couple truths. Biblical truths about these little babies. The first truth I want to talk about for just a moment is human life begins at conception. 
when Mary became pregnant with Jesus, it's really cool. She went to visit her cousin Elizabeth, and Elizabeth was also pregnant with John the Baptist. And, and, and when Mary greets Elizabeth, baby John leaps for joy in the womb, reacting to the presence of God in the room, the Messiah. This is life. Job chapter 10, verse 10, 12, it says this, you guided my conception and formed me in the womb. You clothed me with skin and flesh and you knit my bones and sinews together. You gave me life. The context here is you guided my conception and formed me. You gave me life and showed me your unfailing life. My life was preserved by your care. Human life begins at conception. Another truth is the unborn baby is a person. Psalms 139, verse 13 to 16. I love this. It says, you made all the delicate inner parts of my body and knit me together in my mother's womb. Thank you for making me so wonderfully complex. Your workmanship is marvelous, how well I know it. You watched me as I was being formed in utter seclusion, as I was woven together in the dark of the womb. You saw me before I was born. Every day of my life was recorded in your book. Every moment was laid out before a single day had passed. See, not, not only did God form with his very hands each baby, but he knows them from conception, sees them, and has their life recorded in the book all even before the baby leaves the womb. The unborn baby is a person. Another truth, the life of the unborn baby belongs to God. Ezekiel 18 verse 4 says every soul, every man, every woman, and every child belongs to me. Babies, before they're born, belong to God. They are not ours. They are not ours. We have them, we birth them, we raise them. They are not ours. They are the Lord's. They are the Lord's. Every soul, all souls, this includes all babies. It doesn't matter what type of baby, what the baby looks like, feels like, acts like. All babies, babies with disabilities, babies with abnormalities, all babies belong to the Lord, are created by God, and have equal value. In John chapter 9, verse 1 to 12, there's a story of the man who was born blind. And the disciples want to know, well, what sin happened here? Was it his or was it his parents? Like, what's the situation surrounding this blindness? Jesus says, you're asking the wrong question. There's no cause and effect here. Instead, look for what God can do. See, why someone is born with a disability or an abnormality is not the question. The question is, how can God display his power through that life that was given by him? That's what we should do. That's what we should ask. See, disabilities do not decrease value. All babies and people have equal value and are created by God just the same. Psalms 127 verse 3 says, children are a gift from the Lord. All children are gifts by God for a plan. No child ever, ever has been conceived without a plan for his or her future. Just think about that for a minute. Not one has ever been conceived without a plan. We miss the plan. We see the situation and the struggle. We see that potential outcomes. We are in pain because of the circumstances surrounding. But we miss the spiritual side of the plan of God when we naturalize something so miraculous as a life given. But sometimes in desperate situations, we make desperate choices. See, nothing is easy. It's hard to have a baby when the situation concerning the pregnancy 
has been violence or pain, economic struggle, dealing with disease or disability, it's hard. It's hard to have an abortion to end a life and to walk out that trauma for years to come. It's hard. As April, that morning, that Sunday morning, laid in fetal position on the hard, tear-stained floor, she heard the voice of God say, my daughter, you're forgiven. But you have to forgive yourself. This was her etch-a-sketch moment. We all need one. One to wipe away the painful regrets of the past. One to remind us that others need forgiveness too. One to show us that we have a picture of our lives that isn't perfect. One to remind us that others have an imperfect picture too. An etch-a-sketch life. It's like an oddly shaped, poorly drawn, yet surprisingly accurate view of our lives. And then the ability to shake it and start fresh again. Jesus said he's the road. He said he's the truth. And he said also, also, I am the life. Jeremiah 1 verse 5 says, before I shaped you in the womb, I knew you. Before you saw the light of day, I had holy plans for you. A prophet to the nation is what I had in mind for you. See, he is the life bringing and life giver. He is a life creator and life restorer. Before I shaped you, I knew you. Before you saw the light of day, I had holy plans for you. You can put your name in there. You can put your child's name in there. You can put anyone on the planet, their name in there. You could, you could be Josiah. Before I saw you, I knew you. Before I, I, I formed you, I had holy plans for you. A, a, a worshiper to the nations is what I had for you. You can, you know, a business owner, you know, that will reach the ends of the earth is what I had for you. A, a you know, a actor, a performer, a medical professional, a scientist for the nations is what I had in mind for you. A counselor. You just put your name in there or your child's name before you were shaped and known. The plans were written in the book that you would impact and change the cities and nations that you are in. And that he will give reach through your life. See, God knows every baby before he's formed. And before birth, the baby is set apart for a purpose. Before formed, knowing you, every one. Very recently, the Supreme Court's decision overturning Roe versus Wade was a political victory for many lobbyists, activists, strategists, campaign professionals over literally the course of decades. We all know this. It was also a cultural and religious fight by intercessors over many, many years. We look at some of the demograph of this people and we think a certain way, but maybe some things that we fail to mention that a lot of the people that have been advocates for this decision include the exact demograph that abortion right advocates warn have the most to lose in this new landscape that we now have. Young women. Many, yes, are conservative Christians, but some aren't. Some are secular with efforts against abortion as a progressive stance for human rights. They've seen the pictures of babies in the womb, and they do believe that a baby upon conception is a full human long before it is a viable human. Full human, we understand that not viable, but full, fully human. However, this group doesn't necessarily believe that women should be punished 
or prosecuted for their abortions as they feel that they are somewhat victims of a pro-abortion movement. They also overwhelmingly reject the idea of having the option to abort is necessary uh, to their or any other woman's uh, success in life. They don't feel like they need that option to be successful. More and more young anti-abortion women are stepping up and viewing themselves as human rights activists. Happy warriors, they're calling themselves on the right side of history. A girl by the name of Kristen Hawkins, she's the president of Students for Life of America. She says it's always been a movement of youth. She says the contemporary anti-abortion movement offers more empowering vision to young women than abortion right feminism does. She says if feminism tells young women, well, they need to end their pregnancies in order to achieve education, in order to achieve success and career goals, she says the anti-abortion movement says no, you can actually have it all. You can have the baby and the goals and the career and the success. Young women have now taken up the call to help and to minister and to be there for women who find themselves in impossible situations. Kelly Cornett, now a chief, chief executive for a clinic in Nashville for women, says that she received a call from the Lord as a teenager to care for young women facing unplanned pregnancies. Even in her great care for women, she still stands strong that abortion should not be an option even in the horrible cases of violence. She says, I'm a firm believer that trauma leads to trauma. And a woman ending the life of a child will not make her pain go away. So she's there to help. Then there's the non-Christian, anti-God, anti-abortion activists on the uprise. That sounds interesting. They are a small but boisterous group, actually. A girl by the name of Kristen Turner started a chapter of this group in her hometown here in Northern California. She looks, her Instagram bio would look something like this. She has her pronouns, she, they. She's a, um, a proud supporter of Black Lives Matter. She can just would describe herself as a feminist an atheist, and a leftist. She said this, if someone's committing violence against another human being, then property lines should not be respected. She's been arrested more than three times in activist settings. (laughs) She said the reality is people are dying, so I think whatever privilege I have, I need to go in and leverage it. Now, I'm not saying I support her, like, her behavior. I'm just saying that it is We need to be aware that it is not just the conservative Christian democratic side that are people are advocating for the unborn. There's a whole uprise of human rights activists that do believe or don't believe in God that say, I believe the baby is a full life on conception and I'm willing to stand for the human rights of that baby. See, pro-choice is often spoke as as a, a woman's right to control her home body. And there is and have decisions for their own body. And there's no denying that or no refuting it. A woman should have the right to decide for her own body. However, the unborn baby is not her body. Myself and my daughter, Faith, are no more different people today than we were 17 years ago when she was inside my womb. We were different then, and we are different now. Babies have their own DNA. Pregnancy isn't splitting one body into two. It's one caring and caring for the other. I have a right to me and my body, but faith, even before she was named, before she was viable, had a right to her life. No, this is hard. He is the road. He has to be. He is the truth. He has to be. He has to be. He is the life. 
Because he has to be. It can't be ours. April found forgiveness and salvation that day. But before that day, leading up to that day, she went through a lot of pain. At age 19, when she did walk out of the clinic, a woman walked up to her with a pamphlet. And she looked at her and she said, you did one of those, didn't you? Well, you're going to hell. This is a woman who didn't get it, who didn't see the person right in front of her, instead blinded by the passion of a position and only to make a point. Her Etch-A-Sketch picture didn't look messy like April's, but it didn't look good either. What an opportunity that lady had that day. That moment to shake her picture of how she was, how she used to respond in those situations, how her opinions and convictions used to be. And she could have started fresh by by looking at a scared, hurting, and broken one in front of her and just loving her for where she was. She needed her. She didn't need her pamphlet. She didn't need her position. April said this, she said, I think about that woman with the pamphlet, how she made it more about her than about me. She was just looking to condemn someone, but all I needed was a hug. Human life begins at conception. We have a responsibility to save and preserve that life. Always. This means the baby. However, that mom so many years ago, carrying that little human right now, her life began at conception back then. And we have a responsibility to help her just as much. It's not one or the other. It's both. A lady by the name of Phoebe Purvey works at a pregnancy resource center in Dallas. And they offer free, low-cost prenatal care postpartum services. It's primarily to low-income clientele right now. Pervy was born in a Mexican community in South Texas. Her mom was poor and in an unstable marriage. And she, way back, received help from Planned Parenthood and, and, and financial help from their church. This inspiration from her past provided Pervy with the conviction to help women like her mom. She said that she supports a legal ban on abortion from conception, but she's increasingly uncomfortable using the term pro-life to describe herself because it has this feeling or evokes an emphasis on preventing abortions at any cost rather than helping women. She prefers life-affirming for everyone. It speaks of both anti-abortion, but also goes deeper into assisting, not just saving the baby, but the mom and the future of the family. She said, I am 100% anti-abortion, but at this point in my life, I hold the rights of pre-born children and women equally. But I consider myself a little more women-forward and women-centered because that's where the change happens. See, this is going to be hard. This is not going to be straightforward. The picture is going to be messy, but it is never not an option to not help both lives all the time. There's no alternate validated route here. The enemy, the real destroyer of our lives will tell us that. He will form a lot of reasons why his way, the other way, a different way is the best, that makes the most sense, hurts the least. But he doesn't have the whole picture or share the whole picture. He just shares his part. He just shares the part that will lead you down a road that you never wanted to be led down. The, the road that ends in death. For everyone, death of a life, death of a future, death of hope. The enemy doesn't cover all the parts involved, just his part. Jesus covers all the parts. All the parts. Your part, my part, the baby's part, the mama's part. 
the criminals part, the broken parts. Jesus makes the road for everyone. This is an impossible situation. But Jesus lives in the impossible situation. Sean Smith said this. He said, if you are a true follower of Christ, you can't land where the masses land, but where the Messiah lands. So what is a life worth saving? One that is. Let's stand as we close. See, the character from which you live defines you, which is why we must live from him. Character is not a product of a circumstance, but it's the thing that survives despite it. It will survive based on what gives it life, if it's Jesus or if it's self. In Proverbs 24, verse 11, it says, Rescue those who are being taken away to death, those who are stumbling to the slaughter. If you say, Behold, we didn't know this, does he not who weighs the heart perceive it? Does he not who keeps watch over your soul know it? And will he not repay man according to his work? Another translation says this. It says, Rescue the perishing. Don't hesitate to step in and help. If you say, Hey, that's kind of none of my business, will, will, will that get you off the hook? Someone is watching you closely, you know. Not impressed with weak excuses. See, there's no excuse to stand in silence and do nothing. We have a responsibility. Love will rescue. It's not moved by opinions or positions. It's not enforced by rights. It's not guided by possible or impossible. Not even situations or pain. And most definitely, love isn't guided by alternate validated roots. Jesus in you and through you is your rescue mission. Jesus in you and through you. Jesus will work. He'll work. You can count on it. Why? Because the life giver cannot not bring life. The full life, the best life. In every situation, under every condition, every time. Well, Renee, this seems a little idealistic. It's not. It's not. Will it be simple? No. Will it be easy? No. But it's truth. It's not my truth. It's the truth. The way maker cannot not make a way. <laughs> it's who he is. It's what he does. The promise keeper cannot not keep the promise. It's who he is. It's what he does. Jesus will work. He will work. You can offer him to people. He will work. I'm going to ask our ministry, our prayer team to come right now and just stand across the front. Because I want to give opportunity for you to respond and receive prayer this morning. Yeah, you can come on up and um, just be ready for people to come and pray. See, today we might need to shake our screen clean. This could look like forgiveness, maybe receiving it or giving it. Maybe we've been holding on to some offenses. Maybe you've been holding on to some pain and you just need just a restart. You're forgiven. You're forgiven. You are free. You can start over. You don't need to carry it anymore. See, there's healing from pain and past. This could be a renewed mind where it's like, you know what, my mind, I, I just, I've lived so much with this self-made belief system and I didn't even realize it that I had gotten there. And today I just need to shake that and reflect his thoughts from now on. 
You know the whole I want to think God's thoughts, the rest are just details? We just need to think God's thoughts. This is our etch-a-sketch moment. If you're hurting, it's time for your healing. You don't need to carry it anymore. You don't need to carry it anymore. It doesn't matter what you've done. It doesn't matter the decisions you've made. It doesn't matter. He's right here right now to make it all brand new. It doesn't matter what you thought. It doesn't matter what soapbox you've gone on in the past. You're like, today I just need a realignment of my thoughts to God's thoughts. All of that. And maybe there's other needs you have where you're like, you know what? I have a need and it has nothing to do with any of this. That's okay. God knew before you even got here you had a need. And he had someone lined up to pray with you this morning. But maybe this morning... Maybe you're just hungry. Like when I started. Because really what we need, what will really fix our world and fix ourselves is a renewal of his presence. And I believe that our hunger will unlock that.